Our scripture this morning comes from the book of Exodus. I'll be reading from chapter 14, verse 30, through chapter 15, verse 18. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great work that the Lord did against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. Then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. Horse and rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my might and he has become my salvation. This is my God and I will praise him. My father's God and I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he cast into the sea. His elite officers were sunk in the Red Sea. The floods covered them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shattered the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrew your adversaries, and you sent out your fury. It consumed them like stubble. And the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The floods stood in a heap. The deeps congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake. I will divide the spoil, my desire shall have its fill of them. I will draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them. You blew them with you blew with your wind. The sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in splendor, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand. The earth swallowed them. In your steadfast love, you led the people whom you redeemed. You guided them by your strength to your holy abode. The peoples heard. They trembled. Pangs seized the inhabitants of Philistia. Then the chiefs of Edom were dismayed. Trembling seized the leaders of Moab, and all the inhabitants of Canaan melted away. Terror and dread fell upon them. By the might of your arm, they became still as a stone until your people, O Lord, passed by, until the people whom you acquired passed by. You brought them in and planted them on the mountain of your own possession, the place, O Lord, that you made your abode, the sanctuary, O Lord, that your hands have established. The Lord will reign forever and ever. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, Pharaoh had all the power in the story of the Exodus, or so it seemed. Pharaoh had every bit of the control. Pharaoh had all the wealth of the Egyptian kingdom. Pharaoh had the crops and the livestock. Pharaoh had the horses and the chariots, spears and the soldiers. And Pharaoh had the slaves including the Hebrew people. And Pharaoh had the Hebrew people under his boot or his sandal or whatever it was that Yul Brynner was wearing in the classic movie. He had them working like animals, longer and longer hours, fewer and fewer resources, worsening conditions. And yet, as the story would tell us, the Hebrews survived and multiplied by God's blessing. But God's blessing didn't yet include their freedom at that point anyway, not until Moses was called, not until Moses accepted that call, not until Moses went down and confronted Pharaoh, and then, of course, the plagues, the ten of them, the worst plague, the tenth plague, and finally Pharaoh push the people out saying, go, go, take the people, go worship your God. And the Hebrew people were released 
to begin to leave Egypt. But again, you know the story. Pharaoh watched a big workforce leave his kingdom, and he regretted his decision. He grew angry at what had happened. He gathered up the soldiers and he chased the Hebrews down. The Hebrews might have been strong, they might have been a hardy people, but they were not warriors. They were slaves, right? They knew the straw and the mud. They didn't know the horse and the chariot and the spear. And if Pharaoh were to catch up to them, they were dead. That they knew as well. So again, God made the way through the sea to the other side. And again, most know the story here. The sea parted. The people walked across on the dry ground. As Pharaoh watched that happen, Pharaoh, in his continued rage against what had happened back in Egypt, pursued the people into that divided sea across that dry ground. And Exodus 15.10 says, poetically, you blew with your wind, the sea covered them, they sank like lead. In the story, the Hebrews did not raise a weapon. That's why Hebrews 15 verse 3 says, the Lord is the warrior. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. The song says, you, O Lord, overthrew the adversaries. You, Lord, stretched out your hand. The Lord has thrown the horse and the rider into the sea. The Hebrews walked. That was their call, right? And the Lord fought the battle on their behalf. The Hebrews had no power here, no weapons, no standing army, no control. In the story, Pharaoh had all of that, but the Hebrews had the Lord, and the Lord fought on their behalf. And listen, the Lord did what they could not. The Lord did what they could not do. The Lord is the one who moved Pharaoh to let them go because they couldn't. The Lord parted the sea. They could not have done that. The Lord triumphed over Pharaoh and his army. They could not have done that. The Lord was their strength, the Scripture says, because in the story, they weren't the ones that had any. And so essential to what I'm arguing this morning in this sermon, in Exodus 15, verse 2, the Lord became their salvation The Lord rescued them. The Lord freed them because they couldn't do it themselves. But I want you to hear especially that language that that Moses gives in this song of Exodus 15, and that is the Lord became their salvation. And in the story, their understanding of what that salvation is, is their freedom from Egypt. Salvation as freedom. Freedom as as salvation, either way works in the text. God was their salvation. Not just that God saved them, God became in a noun form their salvation because God freed them, because God was their liberator. God was their liberator. Right? And so in the Exodus story, and in this, this whole song of praise in Exodus 15, Right? Again, salvation is the freedom God achieved for the Hebrew people. So salvation in this text is no longer living as slaves. That is what salvation is in Exodus 15. Salvation is no longer having Pharaoh's boot on their neck, no longer having the taskmaster's whips across their backs. That is salvation. Their salvation is their freedom on the other side of the sea. And of course, we know that story. It was a very hard and arduous journey they were about to embark on on the other side of that sea through the wilderness, all the twists and turns of the wilderness story. But you know what the salvation was? They were free to take that journey. They were free to take that journey is the Exodus 15 understanding of salvation. Freedom is salvation in the Exodus story. We often think about freedom first in political ways. The freedoms we have or or may not have as citizens of any nation or state. Across the world, that sense of freedom is understood and experienced in many different ways. 
in greater degree in some places, in lesser degree in other places. In the United States, we, of course, think we are built on that freedom, right? We believe that we are built, the nation is built on the notions of freedom. We talk about freedom and we talk about rights. In Exodus 15, there was certainly a political freedom that was at work in this text. These folks are now free from a kingdom. They are freed from a totalitarian reality that is the Pharaoh and the Egypt they lived under as slaves. They're now free to go and set up a new way to live together, a new governance, a new system, which for them was the very law of Moses that fills up the rest of the pages of Exodus and Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. But what I also want you to hear this morning is Exodus 15 sets their freedom into a larger story. Not just a political story, but a larger story, and larger than what we do today in states and nations. It's the larger story of theology. It's the story of God. Their freedom is seen in the story of the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of Joseph, which was the story immediately preceding the Exodus in which God did amazing things to free the family of Jacob from their starvation, free them from the trouble that they were in. But only a little while later, they were enslaved in the story. But the God that saved them from that oppression is the God who hears the cries of the slaves and frees them, saves them from that oppression what only God could do because they couldn't do it themselves. In Exodus 15, this song of praise is praise for the freedom that is God's salvation. It's greater, listen, it's greater than only freedom from oppression because it's freedom then to follow God, right? It's freedom to walk in the ways of God, not in the ways of the world around them. It's greater than only freedom to set up a new governance because it's freedom, right, to become the free worshiping people of Yahweh. No longer do they have to be people who nodded their heads to the idols of the Egyptians all around them. They were now free as they moved into this new moment to worship Yahweh and Yahweh alone. And of course, we know in the story in the wilderness There's some ups and downs in that freedom. They don't always get that right. Of course, you think of a golden calf that shows how they didn't early on. But they're free to move into that worshiping people. It's greater than only freedom from slavery because now it's freedom for building their lives. It's freedom to, to build their lives, to build their families, to build their communities based on the imagination of who God is and on the imagination that God had set within them as God's people, as the people that carried the image of God, an image that had been stripped from them, robbed from them in the practices of the Egyptians, in the problem of slavery. And so to me, it's it's little wonder why the biblical exodus and the celebration of freedom as salvation has been so important to African-American Christians in our nation. From slavery, through Reconstruction, through Jim Crow era, even to this present moment, how the biblical exodus is so rich in their theological imaginations about how they conceive not only God, but what God is doing in the world. God is still freeing people from oppression and freeing people from being enslaved. The story and image of salvation in the Exodus is easy to find in the speeches and the sermons of Martin Luther King Jr. It doesn't take but a few minutes, a few minutes in a Google search, and you'll come up with hundreds of references. A gentleman named James Cone, an important black theologian in the United States who's now deceased, wrote in one of his most read books that the scandal of the gospel is that it means liberation, that it means freedom. And James Cone was emphasizing that this freedom that the gospel of Jesus Christ brings, this liberation that the gospel brings, is not just an individual's freedom from sin, but it's also the people's freedom from the big sins around them, the big sins of society, the big sins of nations. That people are set free. Where do you you think Dr. Martin Luther King and Dr. James Cone dug into the Bible to think about those big pictures of freedom from slavery and oppression? 
Yeah, they dug into the story of the Exodus. The Exodus that gave one like James Cone the stories and images of salvation as freedom from slavery and oppression, freedom again for the building of lives created in the image of God, an image that was robbed for so many. You know, if time allowed, I'd I'd make a whole other case of this exodus, salvation, freedom, relationship as, as a theological imagination that's needed for young women and, in many cases, men that are enslaved in sex trafficking, destroying lives, being enslaved. There needs to be an exodus of that and their salvation, freedom from that. You know, the Apostle Paul picks up on this Exodus story. Apostle Paul picks up on this image and imagination of slavery and the way we are entrapped. With Paul, he talks about being enslaved to sin. And the Hebrew people who knew the oppression of Egypt in Paul's day knew the oppression of Rome. And it wasn't just the Hebrew people. Everybody Rome conquered knew the oppression of Rome, including Gentiles, including Hebrews and Gentiles together in the church at Rome. And in many of the other churches that Paul wrote letters to, they knew what it was. Paul was writing to Jews and Gentiles and reminded them of that enslavement, reminded them of that enslavement of their imagination of the Exodus story, but he applied it to the problem of sin. And in Romans 6, Paul begins to talk about being something like slaves to sin, slaves to idolatry, and slaves to greed. And slaves to that, all all the other lists that you hear Paul write about, all the ways we we mistreat each other, right? We mistreat ourselves. All the ways, both ancient and present, it's the same list today, right? That sin destroys lives and communities and takes the image of God that is in all of us and drags it through the mud. And so Paul lays that foundation in Romans 6 of that image of slavery to sin. And then in Romans chapter 7, Paul turns to his own personal struggles with this problem of being trapped in sin, a sin, a struggle I think that we can all relate to. Paul says in Romans 7, those famous lines, I don't do the thing that I want to do, and the thing that I hate is the thing that I do, right? Anybody else feel like that every now and then? I don't do the things I know I'm supposed to do. And for some reason, I can't get out of the trap of falling prey to the same temptation, temptations that I keep falling prey to. Something that we all struggle with. Paul goes on to say that sin, like Pharaoh over the Hebrew slaves, seems to have a power that just won't let us go, just won't free us. Paul even says, it's almost as if it's no longer me who's doing it, but sin that dwells within me. And what Paul is trying to emphasize there is not, it's not my fault, it's the devil's fault, right? Don't fall prey to that. Paul is emphasizing that sin has a power so strong in us sometimes that we simply look around us and say, and throw our hands up and say, Lord, I don't know what to do. I feel powerless. Haven't we all felt that way? You want to stop destructive behaviors. You want to start life-giving behaviors. But sometimes you say, I just can't. You keep tripping on the same problems, into the same sins. You grow weary of fighting. And you just resign yourself to the idea that I guess I'm just not going to win that battle. And so in Romans chapter 7, verse 19, Paul writes, I do not do the good I want, But the evil I don't want is what I do. In the 23rd verse of Romans 7, Paul says, I see in my members another law at war with my mind. Paul talks about it feeling like an internal war inside of him, seeking to follow Jesus and yet being pulled away. In Romans 7 verse 24, Paul finally asks, who will rescue me from this body of death? Who will free me, Paul says? Who will save me? And of course, the answer in Romans 7.25 is, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul knows that Jesus is the one who freed him from sin. And so through the exodus, with the imagination of one like the Apostle Paul in Romans, we have 
in the church proclaimed, have we not, that Jesus sets us free from sin. Do, do we still proclaim that today in the church? That, you know, that Jesus sets us free from sin. Jesus sets us free individually, yes, but not just individually. Also as a people. As a people who follow Jesus, Jesus sets us free Free not to follow the ways of the world. Free to follow the way of Jesus Christ. Jesus sets us free from idolatry and greed and all those other lists of destructive ways we see across the New Testament. So in the Exodus story, God sent Moses to lead them out of the oppression of Egypt into a new moment of freedom. In Exodus 15, the people sing of that freedom as salvation. In the New Testament, in the gospel accounts, God sends Jesus, God sends His Son to lead people out of the oppression of the slavery to sin and into a new moment of freedom, a new moment of forgiveness, of reconciliation with God, of a Jesus way of life empowered by the very Spirit that God the Father and God the Son gives to the church, gives to all of us in order to empower us to do the things it doesn't seem like we can do on our own, to be set free from the power of sin and its oppression over us. And all that sounds really good, which is why we call it good news. But I think an easy follow-up question is, but how? Right? How does Jesus set us free from sin? How did that happen? Am I sure that I'm free? How do I know that I'm free? Again, it sounds like good news to be set free from slavery to sin and oppression, but how do we talk about it? And, and so what Paul finally says is that the only way you'll be set free from sin is through death. The only way you'll be set free from sin is through death. In the news recently when I read of, of the hostages, a handful of those hostages that were killed um, did not get out of Gaza but were killed as some, uh, an action was taking place trying to rescue them, one of the mothers of one of those hostages said of her son, you're finally set free. You're finally set free, set free from that problem, set free from being a hostage, set free from the terror that was going on in that young man's life. It was only through death that he was set free. We are set free, Paul says, through death. You want to be truly free, you have to die. You'll never be free until you die. That sounds a little bit gloomy, doesn't it? Because we believe Jesus is the Son of God, because we believe that His death on the cross was more than His death alone on the cross, because we proclaim that His death on the cross confronted the very sin that has power over us, because we proclaim His death and resurrection overcame the power of sin that has power over us, because we celebrate this victory of Jesus and his faith by then setting our faith in him. Because we believe that in baptism, we die with Jesus in a death like his and rise to walk in the newness of his resurrection life. Then we agree with Paul that our freedom only happens through death and Jesus has lovingly and powerfully given that death to us by His death. We are therefore, through Jesus, by His death and resurrection, a death that we participate in by faith, set free. We are therefore set free by Jesus. And so back in the beginning of Romans chapter 6, Paul says we have been baptized into Christ Jesus into his death. That is why when we practice baptism, we put somebody under the water into their death and then raise them up out of the water to walk in the newness of life. We are baptized into Christ's death so that just as Christ was raised from the dead, we by the glory of the Father, might rise to walk in the newness of life. Or, just as Christ died to overcome 
the power of the slavery of sin, we die and rise to walk in the salvation that is our freedom. We die in Christ. We rise to live in Christ. We are therefore set free in Christ because Jesus is our liberator. Jesus is our liberator. And like Moses sang back in Exodus 15, when he said in verse 2, God has become our salvation, we sing in light of the gospel that Jesus has become our salvation. He has set us free. And this, friends, is what we celebrate at the table this morning. As we gather now our focus upon the Lord's Supper, we do so in the recognition that by the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, we know the forgiveness of our sins and therefore our freedom. And by His resurrection, we have a demonstration of the very power of God over that world, over that world of sin, over that thing that that seemed to have power over us. We're set free from that because Jesus both died and rose again. And so as we take the bread, which is the body of Jesus Christ, into our bodies, we both remember, but also we bodily take it into us. We as Baptists don't always do a very good job of of, of remembering that, right? It's just a symbol, well, maybe, but it's also something we actually eat. And because we actually eat it, we take this good news all the way into our gut. Amen. Because we actually drink the cup, we take the sacrificial love of God and Jesus Christ all the way into our gut. And maybe once it gets into our gut, we can see the change happen, right? Once it gets into our gut, we can really begin to believe from the gut that we are set free.